one of the country's small states, but yet one of the most influential politically and strategically. With the start of the rolling hills in the east to the heavily populated coastline with the saltwater marshes and the beautiful coastal towns. One of the first written constitutions of democratic government was written here, giving it the nickname the Constitution State. Connecticut gets its name from the Algonquian word meaning land on the long tidal river. The motto, I am not even going to try and pronounce it, but it means he who transplanted still sustains. Connecticut was admitted to the Union on January 9, 1788, making it the fifth state in the country. Before this, the state had a few colonies within, but the Connecticut colony was what it was before statehood. The capital of Connecticut is Hartford, which has a population of 121,054 people, ranking it the 29th most populated capital behind Topeka, Kansas, and ahead of Springfield, Illinois. The largest city in Connecticut is Bridgeport, with a population of 148,333 people, ranking it the 183rd biggest city in the United States, behind Panama, California, and ahead of Denton, Texas. Bridgeport has a smaller population in its metropolitan area than Hartford, with 959,768 people living there in 2021, ranking it the 59th in the nation. Hartford Metro has 1,211,906 people, ranking it the 48th largest in 2021. The largest metropolitan area that spills into Connecticut is New York City Metro, and the largest metro where Connecticut City is the heart is the Greater Hartford Metro, behind New Orleans and ahead of Buffalo. Connecticut has a total area of 5,543.41 square miles, ranking it the third smallest state behind New Jersey and ahead of Delaware. 4,842.36 square miles of that is land area, making it the third smallest behind Hawaii and ahead of Delaware. Connecticut also has a water area of 701.06 square miles, ranking it the 38th largest in terms of water area behind Wyoming and ahead of Indiana. Connecticut has a population density of 745 people per square mile, ranking it the fourth most crowded state behind Massachusetts and ahead of Maryland. Connecticut is fully in the eastern time zone and is one of the first to see the sun rise in the U.S. The average elevation in Connecticut is 500 feet above sea level, tying with Alabama and Massachusetts for 41st in the country. Connecticut's highest point is the southern slope of Mount Frizzle, which is located in Massachusetts. The elevation is 2,386 feet above sea level, ranking at the 39th highest in the nation behind Cheehaw Mountain in Alabama and ahead of Eagle Mountain in Minnesota. Connecticut's population in 2010 was 3,574,097 people, which grew in 2020 with a population being 3,605,944 people. This was the fourth slowest growth in the nation with 0.89% increase behind Michigan with a 1.96% increase and ahead of Illinois with a negative 0.14 decrease. This makes Connecticut the 29th most populated state behind Oklahoma and ahead of Utah. Connecticut's population slightly decreased in 2021 by 347 people. 31,847 people moved to Connecticut between 2010 and 2020, which was the seventh least in the United States behind Maine, who brought in 33,998 people, and ahead of Alaska, who brought in 23,160 people. The state flag of Connecticut consists of a white barogue shield with three grapevines, each holding three bunches of purple grapes. This is the standard for many states with the state seal placed on a blue background. Underneath the state seal reads Connecticut state motto. This flag was approved in 1897 by the Connecticut General Assembly. This is personally one of my least favorite flags in which I ranked it 48th in my state flag beauty in my TikTok series. Connecticut is located in the northeastern United States or also known as New England. It is the second smallest New England state ahead of Rhode Island and is also the second most populated state in New England region just behind Massachusetts. Connecticut is bordered to three states along with the Long Island Sound on the southern coast. New York is bordered to the east, Massachusetts to the north, and Rhode Island to the west. Connecticut's charter of 1662 allowed it to claim most of Rhode Island's land and all lands west to the Pacific along with the eastern Long Island. In 1664, the Duke of York established a patent which created New York and gave Long Island Sound with everything west of Connecticut's river to New York. In 1682, Connecticut negotiated for more land, which included much of the Hudson River Valley, which makes the state look like what it does today. The northern border with Massachusetts had a few surveying issues in its history, but was finally settled in 1826. Connecticut also had a few border issues with Rhode Island, with taxation along the border, but nothing has been made serious of it. Connecticut is a relatively low-lying state with a portion of the Appalachian Mountains running through the northwest corner of the state. Connecticut's lowest point is along the shoreline with the Long Island Sound. The state has had a long maritime history, but technically it don't have a direct ocean front. 
The coast is only along the Long Island Sound, which is an estuary. Connecticut's access to the Atlantic Ocean goes west towards New York City and east towards Rhode Island. Long Island also protects Connecticut's shoreline from high waves caused by storms. The landscape of Connecticut varies, from rolling low-lying mountains in the northwest corner to coastal marshes and beaches to the coast. As you move east in the Central Valley, the state stays flat. Connecticut is split right down the middle by southern flow in Connecticut River. Connecticut is home to more than 5,800 miles of rivers and streams, which is equivalent to the both U.S.-Mexico and U.S.-Canada international borders. The state is home to four federally designated wild and scenic river systems, which are the Eighth Mile River, the Low Farmington River and Salmon Brook, the West Branch Farmington River, and the Wood and Pocatuck River systems. The state has over 3,000 lakes, ponds, and reservoirs that offers a bunch of water activities. Candlewood Lake is the largest lake in Connecticut, with a surface area of 5,420 acres. The lake lies in Fairfield and Litchfield counties, with five lake towns surrounding the lake. With 55.24% of the state covered in forests, this makes Connecticut 16 most forested state behind Michigan and ahead of Rhode Island. Metamorphic rock is exposed in the Appalachian Mountains from the Great Uplift when Pangaea first formed. When the continents collided, this caused faulting when the Atlantic Ocean floor spread. This caused the eastern border fault, which stretches 130 miles from New Haven, Connecticut into New Hampshire. The land west of this turned into a rift valley. This made the land tilt 15 to 25 degrees, but now the fault is no longer active and with the formation of the basin eventually refilled with soft fluvial and alluvial sediments. The Ice Age shaped much of Connecticut's landscape, with eroding mountains and glacial till left everywhere. One of the biggest glacial lakes at the time was Lake Hitchhawk, which is an extremely important part of Connecticut's geology. The lake eventually retreated to present-day Connecticut River. This has held a major impact on Connecticut's geology, in which the lake left behind a soft, far landscape, gathering sand and silt in the summertime since there was so much glacial meltwater and clay in the winter. Connecticut's River Valley is a very soft and nutrition-rich area and is home to much of Connecticut's farmland. This is caused by the Connecticut River often flooding, which resedimented the land. As you move away from the river on both sides, the land becomes less suitable for farmland. Forests in Connecticut consist of a mix of northeastern coastal forests of oak and southern areas of the state. New England Acadian forests creep into the northwestern parts of the state. Mountain laurel, rose bay, rhododendron are two native flowers located in several parts of the state. The Atlantic white cedar is found in the southern wetlands, and the Pacon State Forest is home to the Rhododendron Sanctuary Trail, where the Roseberry Rhododendron is mostly found in the eastern uplands of Connecticut. The Opention Humifusion, I hope I pronounced that right, is the lone, lone native cactus in the state and is found in sandy coastal areas in the low hillsides. Several types of beach grasses and wildflowers are also found native to Connecticut. Connecticut's coast is a broad transition zone where southern and subtropical plants are cultivated. Magnolia grandiflower, crepe myrtles, scrub palms, needle palms can be found in Connecticut's coastal communities in small numbers. A large part of the state is covered with oak hickory type central hardwood forests. Before it was dominated by various oaks and chestnuts, but hickory replaced chestnuts with the spread of the chestnut blight. Northern hardwood type trees are present in the northwestern hills of the state. The state tree is the charter oak, and the state flower is the mountain laurel. The state may be small, but it packs a decent punch of biodiversity. Notable wildlife in Connecticut includes badgers, beavers, long-tailed weasels, and white-tailed deer. The coastal land and marshes is home to a healthy amount of marine population as well. In 1975, Connecticut made the sperm whale the state animal, mainly because of the history it has with the state and also to raise awareness of it being endangered. In 1943, the American robin became the state bird, thanks to the chirps and songs they sing throughout the state. Black bears, coyotes, and red foxes are all predators that can be found in the state. Woodchucks, otters, beavers, turtles, and a number of frogs and snakes can be found in the marshlands of Connecticut. Gray and harbor seals, along with porpoises, can be found on Connecticut's beaches. Copperheads and timber rattlesnakes are probably the most dangerous animals in the state, as they are the most poisonous, but both have a small population in the state. The star-nosed mole is native to Connecticut, but is one of the rarest mammals you can see, but they are located in the wetlands of the state. There are 14 species of snakes in Connecticut, but most are small and avoid humans. Common ones you will see are the smooth green snake, garter snake, and the red belly snake. If you see a snake near the water, it is most likely a northern water snake. In total, there is roughly 40 mammal species, reptiles, and amphibian species, numbered around 50, and there is also over 400 bird species.
There are too many insects to count, but the state insect of Connecticut is the European praying mantis, which gets its acknowledgement on October 1st, 1977. The American shad was designated the state fish in 2003. Connecticut lies in a transition zone between the southern end of the humid continental climate and the northern portion of the humid subtropical climate. Northern Connecticut experiences cold winters with moderate snowfall and hot humid summers. Southern and coastal Connecticut experiences cold winters with a mix of rain and slight snow with long and hot humid summers. Connecticut averages 50.3 inches of rainfall for a year, which makes it the ninth wettest state, which is tied with North Carolina. The state sees considerable snowfall with 37.9 inches annually, making it the 14th snow snowiest state behind Rhode Island and ahead of South Dakota. Early spring temperatures average from 40 degrees Fahrenheit to the lower 50s. As you go into late April and into May, temperatures increase considerably into a near summer-like fill. The hottest recorded day in Connecticut was 106 degrees in Danbury on July 15, 1995. This is tied with New Hampshire for the fourth coldest, warmest day. On February 16, 1943, Norfolk, Connecticut got down to negative 37 degrees. This ties it with Kentucky and West Virginia for the 17th warmest, coldest day. Connecticut has an average temperature of 49 degrees, making it the 29th warmest state. Connecticut has sunny summers, but the state experiences thunderstorms and averages one tornado per year. Although the state has a coast, hurricanes are rare because the water temperatures are cold, but the state often experiences remnants of hurricanes. A few notable hurricanes that have made its way up to Connecticut is the 1938 New England hurricane, Hurricane Carol in 1954, Hurricane Sandy in 2012, and Hurricane Isaiah in 2020. Fall-like weather begins in October and lasts until early December. When the fall weather begins, Connecticut becomes a hot spot for tourists as it is one of the best fall foliage states in the country. In the winter months, northern Connecticut receives more snowfall than southern Connecticut. Connecticut also occasionally gets heavy nor'easterns and ice storms. The most notable ones were the southern New England ice storm of 1973 and the December 2008 nor'eastern United States ice storm. Connecticut has had 31 natural disasters, which is the fourth least in the country behind Wyoming and ahead of South Carolina. 98% of Connecticut's population in 1940 was white or Caucasian. Since then, Connecticut has diversified with 75.8% of the population being white or Caucasian, 13.6% of the population being black or African American, 18.9% of the population being Hispanic or Latino, and 6.1% of the population being Asian. Connecticut was first explored by the Dutch but the first permanent settlements were made by English Puritans who came from Massachusetts in 1663. Connecticut enjoyed political independence with the Fundamental Orders of 1639, which was based on the will of the people. These orders are said to have been the first written constitution of democratic government, which gave Connecticut its nickname, the Constitution State. Thomas Hooker and Samuel Stone led a group of about 100 people and created a settlement of Hartford in 1636. Thomas Hooker was a huge influence in the development of colonial New England. He was a prominent Christian preacher and one of the first settlers of Connecticut along with Hartford. He was cited as one of the inspirations for the fundamental orders of Connecticut. With limited land for agriculture, the state turned towards manufacturing and took a leading role in the Industrial Revolution of the United States. Education also took a big step forward with Yale University leading the charge. Farmers from Connecticut moved to New York and the Midwest for more farming opportunities. Various Algonquian tribes inhabited areas in Connecticut prior to English settlement. The English had a trade post in Windsor, which threatened Dutch trade. The Dutch sent a party upriver as far as modern-day Springfield, Massachusetts, and they gave gifts to convince the indigenous inhabitants to bring their trade to the Dutch post of Hartford. This unfortunately brought smallpox to the region, and by the end of the 1633-34 winter, the native population dropped from over 8,000 to less than 2,000. Following trade pressures and the spread of diseases, the Pequots tightened their hold on the river tribes. In 1635, several incidents happened in, that involved the colonists in which a raid followed. The colonists burned out 300 Pequot men, women, and children in their village in Mystic, Connecticut. On May 1, 1637, leaders of towns along Connecticut River sent delegates to Hartford, which began self-government in Hartford. John Mason commanded the militia and then declared war on the Pequots. When the war concluded, the Pequots were completely wiped out and the land controlled by the Pequots was divided by the New England colonies and allies with the Treaty of Hartford in 1638. In 1637, a group of London merchants moved to Boston with the intention of creating a new settlement. 
These merchants were led by John Davenport and Theopilus Eaton. The best port locations in Massachusetts had been taken, but there were good harbors available on the Long Island Sound. In the spring of 1638, Eaton found a good location in what is New Haven. They liked the location of a good port line between Boston and New Amsterdam, which is now New York City. It also has good access to the furs of the Connecticut River Valley settlements of Hartford and Springfield. These settlers had no official charter or permissions and didn't purchase any land rights from local Indians. New Haven Colony never had a legal title and that became its biggest issue. The much larger Connecticut Colony obtained a royal charter in 1662 and it used its military to force a takeover of the New Haven Colony. The charter granted the Connecticut Colony with a strip of land that advanced all the way to the Pacific Ocean. This strange strip of land that looks goofy on a map never fell through and the Connecticut colony lost its claim to this strip of land. King James II created a colony to keep a close eye on this region. The Dominion was also designed to strengthen the colonial defense in the event of a war with the Native American population. The Dominion also enforced the Navigation Acts which prohibited the colony from trading with countries not ruled by the British Crown. Sir Edmund Andros was chosen to govern the Dominion after previously serving as the governor of New York and New Jersey. Boston was chosen as the capital, and soon as Andros arrived, he took his power seriously. Town meetings were severely restricted, and local legislatures were taken away. Andros raised taxes to help with revenue, and did so without a vote, which angered council members. And when the taxes didn't work, he raised levies on wine, rum, and brandy, in which council members didn't like either. Andros mostly ignored Connecticut, and the Philians were likewise with Connecticut. Andros was eventually arrested by the citizens of Boston, and they sent him back to England in chains. On May 9, 1689, the Connecticut court met and voted to restore the old charter. Connecticut designated four delegates to the Second Continental Congress, who would sign the Declaration of Independence. Those delegates were Samuel Huntington, Roger Sherman, William Williams, and Oliver Wolcott. Connecticut's manufacturing industries helped with weaponry for the Revolutionary War. Connecticut wasn't involved directly in a battle until 1775, when Connecticut sent some 1,200 troops to help neighboring Massachusetts in the battles of Lexington, Concord, and Bunker Hill. Connecticut wasn't occupied by British forces like its bordering states were, but experienced several British raids. In 1777, the British landed in Westport and marched 2,000 troops to Danbury, because some of the Continental Army supplies was located there. British troops destroyed much of the depot, along with some homes in Danbury. On the march back, the Continental Army, led by General David Wooster and General Benedict Arnold, met the British in Ridgefield. This deterred any future landings for the rest of the war. There was a number of raids that were launched in Connecticut against Long Island. For the winter of 1778 and 79, General George Washington decided to split the Continental Army into three divisions, and one of those divisions was led by General Israel. This division was just outside of New York City in Reading and guarded the depot in Danbury while it replenished supplies and also offered support along the Long Island Sound and the Hudson River Valley. This camp struggled with supply shortages along with cold temperatures and snow. General William Tyrone raided Connecticut's coast in July of 1779. This was known as Tyrone's Raid, in which 2,700 men raided the ports of New Haven, Fairfield, and Norwalk. Several people were killed on both sides and tons of infrastructure was destroyed. The raid was based off a larger plan to draw George Washington's troops to a location more effective for the British to attack, but ultimately this failed. The Federalist Party had a stronghold on New England, which included Connecticut. There were several pushes to get people out and vote. There was annual town meetings in which managers were told to count all registered voters and what party they were for. This was a highly coordinated get out the vote, which is a common nowadays action, but one of the first in the world history. The state prospered during the era until the War of 1812 severely damaged businesses in Connecticut. During the War of 1812, the British blockade cut off imports from Britain and which stimulated rapid growth of factories in the state. Eli Whitney, was a leader of engineers and inventors that was made Connecticut a world leader in the machine tools and industrial technology in the city of New Haven. The Federalist Party continued its grip on the state of Connecticut until the failure of Hartford Convention wounded the party in 1814. The Hartford Convention was a series of meetings in which the Federalist Party discussed the concerns they had of the War of 1812 and the political problems arising from the federal government's increasing power. With the failure of the convention, the Republican Party took control in 1817 for the first time. 
the state of Connecticut adhered to the 1662 charter until 1818, in which a new state constitution was adopted. The state became an industrial leader quickly, and between 1790 and 1930, Connecticut had more patents issued per capita than any other state. The first invention ever recorded in the state was the lapidary machine by Abdel Boyle in 1765. In 1848, Connecticut abolished slavery, which caused migration of African Americans to urban areas for employment and opportunity. Before this, in 1832, Quaker school teacher Prudence Crandall created the first integrated school. Many prominent people objected what Mr. Crandall was doing at Canterbury Female Boarding School and wanted him to step down, but he refused. This led to parents removing their daughters from the school, which made Mr. Crandall have to change it to a full African-American girls' school. Connecticut played a crucial role in the American Civil War, which provided much supplies, weapons, and money for the Union Army. Towns such as Farmington and Milton were stops along the Underground Railroad, and slavery was slowly phased out in the state, beginning in 1797 with less than 100 known slaves in the state by 1820. Connecticut, along with the rest of New England, voted for Republicans because the party opposed extension of slavery in the Western territories. Connecticut's residents embraced the slogan, free speech, free press, free soil, free men, Fremont, and victory. Republican Governor William Buckingham was anti-slavery and his altitude towards the stands got stronger leading up to the Civil War and as the war raged on. Following the attack on Fort Sumter and Charleston Harbor, Buckingham, along with Abraham Lincoln, called for volunteers to join the Union Army in the war efforts. Connecticut furnished plenty of regiments of heavy artillery and infantry. The state also supplied some light artillery along with cavalry. Fort Trumbull in New London served as an organizational center for Union troops, along with being the headquarters for the U.S. 14th Infantry Regiment. The Yale New Haven Hospital treated 23,340 soldiers, in which 185 of them sadly passed. One of the first Union officers killed in the war was New Haven's Theodore Winthrop. New Haven Arms Company provided the Union Army with rifles along with Colt's Manufacturing Company. Pratt & Whitney, a Hartford-based firm, provided machinery and support equipment to Army contractors to produce weapons. Most brass buttons, belt buckles, and other fittings in the uniforms were made in Waterbury. The Mystic Shipyards provided ships for the Union Navy. The popular late war marching song, Marching Through Georgia, was written by Henry Clay Work, who was a Middleton resident. Around 55,000 Connecticut men served during the Civil War, and around 10% of those were lost their lives. Today, over 130 monuments mark the Civil War's imprint on the state. Travel was dominated by the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad System. And Baker J.P. Morgan grew up in Hartford and had a strong interest in the New England economy. In the 1890s, he began investing in the railroad system around New England. By 1912, they operated over 2,000 miles of track and 120,000 employees worked for them. It basically monopolized traffic between Boston and New York City, which was the goal. This angered some, but most notably Boston's lawyer, Louise Spandeis. The rail system was named New Haven and was managed by Charles Mellon. Mellon's tactics turned detrimental and led to high prices and costly construction. They tried to save on maintenance costs, which in turn rose the accident rate. The company had $14 million in debt in 1903, which rose to $242 million in a matter of 10 years. Soon after, the company got hit with a lawsuit by the federal government, which forced out trolley systems. The line eventually went bankrupt in 1935, reorganized afterwards and got reduced but went bankrupt again in 1961. And in 1969, merged with Penn Central System, which also went bankrupt. Whatever was left over from the rail system is now a part of Conrail. Soon after the rail system made its way, the automobile revolution soon followed. When World War I broke out in 1914, Connecticut's large machine industry received contracts from British, Canadian, and French interests, along with U.S. forces as well. The state supported the country's war effort with large war bonds purchases, expansion on the war industry, and increasing food production on farms. When the war ended, the Spanish flu hit the state hard due to it being a travel hub. An estimated 8,500 to 9,000 state residents died from it, which is about 1% of the population at the time. Factors in the state attracted European immigrants like crazy. By 1910, Connecticut's population was almost 30% foreign-born. Travel was almost impossible for civilians, so many immigrants stayed in the state, got embedded deeper to their jobs, and became permanent residents. With rising unemployment in urban areas, Republicans lost grip of the state, and in 1931, the state elected Governor Wilbur Lucius Cross, who was a Democrat. The president at the time, Franklin D. Roosevelt, introduced his New Deal policies, in which Governor Cross supported. These policies helped with public services, infrastructure, 
instituting a minimum wage, and they also helped construct the Merritt Parkway. After Governor Cross' term ended, the state elected Republican Governor Raymond E. Baldwin, in which made the state a competitive two-party state. On September 21, 1938, the most destructive storm in New England's history was a hurricane that was named the Long Island Express, and it struck eastern Connecticut. The hurricane went just west of New Haven and destroyed the state's coast between Old Saybrook and Stonington. Heavy rainfall from the hurricane caused the Connecticut River to flood downtown Hartford and East Hartford. Before and during World War II, the U.S. invested in its defense industry to help from the lingering depression. Pratt and Whitney manufactured airplane engines, parachutes, and submarines. Connecticut manufactured 4.1% of the total United States military arraignments produced during World War II, which was the ninth highest in the country. Most munitions ended along with the war in 1945, but new industries evolved with tech and airplane parts. After the war, the state suburbs thrived, with people moving out of the cities. The state built the first nuclear-powered submarine, the USS Nautilus, and other essential weapons for the Pentagon. The increased straw market in the early 1960s gave Connecticut the highest per capita income in the nation. I'm having a hard time saying this word, but I'm going to try. Deindustrialization left many industrial centers with empty factories, mills, and high unemployment. In 1987, Hartford became the first U.S. city to elect an African-American woman as mayor, Carrie Saxon Perry. When the Cold War ended, it made it challenging for Connecticut's economy since it depended on the defense industry. Connecticut's agriculture included tobacco farming, in which brought domestic and international immigrants, but when tobacco declined, the immigrants decided to live, live there permanently. The Pequots made plans for the multi-million dollar casino complex, which was completed in 1992 and named the Foxwoods Casino. This brought in massive amounts of revenue, which made the Mantucket Pequot Reservation one of the wealthiest in the country. In 1994, the Mohegan Reservation also opened a successful casino near the town of Uncastville called the Mohegan Sun. These casinos was the beginning of a shift in the economy to entertainment with ESPN headquartered in the state as well, along with financial services and pharmaceuticals. The 21st century started with tragedy, with the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001. 65 state residents from Fairfield County were killed on the tragic day who were working in the World Trade Center. A memorial was set up at Sherwood Island State Park in Westport, in which the New York skyline is visible. Connecticut got rocked with a number of political scandals, with two mayors getting removed from office in 2003. Governor John G. Rowland resigned during a corruption investigation in which he pleaded guilty in 2004. In 2011 and 2012, Connecticut was hit with three major storms in just over 14 months. Hurricane Irene struck on August 28th which was blamed for the killing of three residents and caused $235 million in damage. Two months later, the Halloween Nor'easter dropped tons of snow in Connecticut. With leaves still in the trees, this caused even more damage, with some places not even having electricity for 11 days. Connecticut has 169 towns, including 21 cities within its borders. Bridgeport is the largest city in Connecticut, with a population of 148,333 people within the city, ranking it the fifth biggest city in New England and 183rd in the nation, behind Rockford, Illinois, and ahead of Syracuse, New York. 959,768 people live in the metropolitan area, making it the 59th most populated in the nation, behind Omaha, Nebraska, and ahead of Greenville, South Carolina. Bridgeport is located in southwestern Connecticut and is a major U.S. port right along Connecticut's coast. Stanford is the second most populated city in Connecticut, with a population of 136,309 people, making it the 205th most populated city behind Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and ahead of Victorville, California. Stanford passed up New Haven and Hartford in the 2020 census and is part of the Bridgeport metropolitan area. New Haven is the third most populated city in the state, with 135,000 people, making it the 209th most populated city behind Elizabeth, New Jersey, and ahead of Miramar, Florida. 863,700 people live in the metropolitan area, making it the 69th largest behind Allentown, Pennsylvania, and ahead of Northport, Florida. Like Bridgeport and Stanford, New Haven is located on the southwestern coast of Connecticut. Hartford is the fourth most populated city in the state, but Wheatley has the most populated metropolitan area in the state. 120,000 people live in within the city, making it the 238th most populated behind Rochester, Minnesota, and ahead of College Station, Texas. With 1,211,906 people living in the metro, making it the 48th most populated behind New Orleans and ahead of Buffalo. Hartford is located in central Connecticut and sits on the Connecticut River. Waterbury is the fifth most populated city in Connecticut, with a population of 113,811 people, making it the 263rd biggest city. 
behind Elgin, Illinois, and ahead of Springfield, Illinois. This makes it the 10th largest city in the New York metropolitan area and the 9th largest in New England. Waterbury is located in western Connecticut and sits on the Nakatuck River. There are eight counties in Connecticut, which is the fourth least in the nation. Only Rhode Island, Hawaii, and Delaware have a smaller amount of counties. Litchfield County is the largest county in Connecticut with 920 square miles. Middlesex County is the smallest in the state with only 369 square miles. With 959,768 people and its location right outside of New York City, Fairfield County is the most populated county in the state. Windham County has the least amount of people with only 116,418 people. East Berlin and Hartford County is the geographic center of the state. The total GDP of Connecticut is almost $318 million, making it the 23rd highest behind Missouri and ahead of Oregon. Its GDP is growing at below average rate of 4.2%, making it the 36th fastest. Connecticut has a median household income of $79,855, making it the 5th highest behind Hawaii and ahead of California. The per capita income in Connecticut is $45,359 making it the second highest just behind Massachusetts. Notable businesses based in Connecticut are Duracell, ESPN, Subway, and WWE to name a few. Like many New England states, the taxes are pretty rough. Connecticut has the second worst tax burden in this country, 6.99% income tax rate, which is above average. The gas tax is 17th highest in the country and the fourth worst property tax rate in the nation. The sales tax rate in the state actually isn't that bad and it's the 18th lowest in the country. With Connecticut's location in northeastern megalopolis, transportation is vital within the state. The famous I-95 goes along Connecticut's southern coast all the way from east to west. I-84 travels southwest and northeast, cutting right through the middle of the state. I-91 travels north to south through the center of the state. And lastly, you have I-395 traveling north to south near the eastern border of the state. Major highways in Connecticut also include the Merritt Parkway and the Wilburn Cross Parkway, which together create the Connecticut Route 15. U.S. highways in Connecticut include U.S. 1, 5, 6, 7, 44, and 202. I-95 between New Haven and New York City is one of the most congested highways in the United States. The state has encouraged traffic reduction schemes, including riding a train and carpooling. The bike riding community in Connecticut is also one of the most active in the country, with a very high bicycle ownership, especially in New Haven. With many citizens in southwestern Connecticut working in New York City, Train as a form of transportation is big in the region. Metro North provides commuter service between New Haven and New York City. Amtrak's Northeast Corridor goes within the state of Connecticut with the Hartford Line operating between New Haven and Springfield. Connecticut's largest airport is Bradley International Airport in Windsor Locks, just north of Hartford. Many people traveling to Connecticut fly into JFK International or Newark International Airports in New York City. Tweed New Haven Regional Airport provides a more regional air service in the state of Connecticut. Larger civil airports are Danbury Municipal Airport and Waterbury Oxford Airport in Western Connecticut, Harford Bernard Airport in Central Connecticut, and Groton New London Airport in Eastern Connecticut. There is also several ferry services that connect Connecticut to Long Island. Connecticut has a partisan voting index of D plus 7, which is tied with Illinois for the ninth most Democratic state in the country. The last Republican president candidate Connecticut voted for was George H.W. Bush in 1988. Connecticut, along with Rhode Island, are the only two states that don't have county governments. George W. Bush is the only president that was born in the state of Connecticut, with his birthplace being in New Haven. Connecticut has seven electoral votes, which is the second most in New England, and is tied with Oklahoma and Oregon. Connecticut has a high school graduation rate of 91.1% and at least a bachelor degree graduation rate of 40.6%. According to Wallet Hub, Connecticut ranks second in the nation for quality of public schools. Connecticut is home to the nation's first law school in Litchfield, and well-known universities located in Connecticut are Yale University and Trinity College. The United States Coast Guard Academy is also located in New London. Connecticut has one professional sports team, and that's the Connecticut Sun of the WNBA, and they play in Uncastville. The state has hosted a PGA Tour event every year since 1952 in the Hartford area. The name has changed multiple times and is known as the Travelers' Championship. College basketball is huge in the state, with the Connecticut Huskies University being the only Division I university in the state. The women's basketball team, in my opinion, is the best women's college basketball program in the nation. The men's basketball team has also added on a few national championships itself. In 2014, they repeated the same accomplishment, so they have done this rare feat twice. 
The Huskies women's college basketball team also holds a record for the longest winning streak in college basketball with 111 games won in a row. Yale University is another prominent Division I college as well and is also involved in the second oldest college football rivalry in the country between them and Hartford and is played in New Haven. Other Connecticut universities that host Division I sports are Central Connecticut State, Fairfield, Sacred Heart, Quinnipiac, and Hartford. Connecticut isn't a huge national player in agriculture, but it produces well at the state level. It contributes to $4 billion of the state's economy each year from its thousands of farms across the state. Greenhouse and nursery products account for over half the state's agriculture production. Other important crops include apples, hay, dairy products, shellfish, and tobacco. Connecticut also ranks 10th in the nation for maple syrup production. According to Wallet Hub, Connecticut has the 8th best health care in the nation. Cost within the state is on the expensive side, being the 37th highest in price, but access to health care and outcomes both rank in the top 10. Connecticut has some of the most state parks in the country with 110. The state also has 32 state forests, which gives the state a bunch of state level protected areas. The state is home to the Appalachian, New England, and Washington, and Rochamu National Historic Trails, along with the Coltsville and Weir Farm National Historic Parks. Keeney Point and Stuart B. McKinney are the two national wildlife refuges located in the state. Like I said earlier, George W. Bush was born in Connecticut, but his father, George H. W. Bush, grew up in Greenwich, Connecticut. Other notable people from or raised in Connecticut is Charles Dow, Roger Sherman, Jackie Robinson, J.P. Morgan, Merrill Streep, and Mark Twain, to name a few. Connecticut is home to a bunch of firsts, with the first American Dictionary being written in the state, the first insurance was sold in the state, the USS Natillus was the first nuclear submarine that was built in the state. The first helicopter was flown here. The first phone book was published here. The first motorized speed limit was enacted in the state. The first woman to get a patent in the U.S. was from Connecticut. The first steel mill in America was in Connecticut. And the state is home to the first hamburger. Other interesting facts about Connecticut is the license plate started here. The state used to have two capitals. The Scoville Memorial Library in Connecticut is the oldest in the U.S. Other interesting facts about Connecticut is license plates started in the state, and the state used to have two capitals. The Scoville Memorial Library in Connecticut is the oldest library in the United States. ESPN was founded in Connecticut, and the largest maritime museum in the world is located in the state. Famous inventions that came out of Connecticut are the lollipop, frisbees, the helicopter, flavored toothpaste, a sewing machine, payphones, Polaroid camera, the portable typewriter, wiffle ball, can openers, and anesthesia. Delicious native food from Connecticut consists of lobster rolls, pizza, steamed cheeseburgers, apple ciders, deep river snacks, New Haven style clam pizza, and much, much more. If there is more you think I should discuss, please let me know down in the comments below for a potential part two. Thank you everyone for watching, and if you liked the video, please hit the thumbs up, and since you're there, you might as well hit the subscribe button as well. Stay tuned for my next part in the series in which I'll be covering Massachusetts. Thank you again for watching. Have an amazing day. And until next time, World Geo out.